we are asking the question, what are the main things that a church is to be involved in? What are our main activities? What are the most important things? What are the non-negotiables? And four sermons, this is the third of four. And um, we, we have a mission statement in our church, and it's going to be loaded on the website here probably this week or next, and, and we'll have some things about that. But uh, we have this mission statement, as I said before, Providence Bible Church exists to worship God in spirit and truth. We talked about that already. Grow in knowledge through discipleship and fellowship. We haven't talked about that, but we will next week. Serve one another in the community and share the gospel. We're going to talk about sharing the gospel today. You'll notice that we haven't gone in order of the mission statement. And some of you, I know that bothers you. I I know those kind of people, okay? I tend to be that kind of a person. However, what I decided to do is cover two passages. And we covered Matthew 22, 37 to 40 first. Now we're covering Matthew 28, 18 to 20. We're going to cover the next two from that that, uh, part of Scripture. But what... um, um, Mark just read is commonly called the Great Commission. The the Great Commission is the universal marching order for the church. Do you realize, and maybe for some of you this would have been great, do you realize that God could have just taken us to heaven as soon as we got saved? He could have just, boom, you got saved, you go to heaven. But why didn't he? One of the reasons why is so that we can share the good news, which is what the word gospel means. You're familiar with the word gospel. That word means good news. And for just a minute, I want to get into the weeds about the Great Commission, if you don't mind. I think this is going to be helpful, and it's going to to help you out. And so some of you don't like this kind of stuff, but I think it will help you, and it might be interesting. When you look at the Great Commission, what is the command? There's a command in there. What is the command? Yep, I knew everybody would say that, and everybody's wrong. <laughs> I want to show you something here real quick, and I, uh, this may be a blessing to you. The actual command of the Great Commission is make disciples. So why does go and everything sound like it's, it's the command? Let me explain a little feature about the original language. Are you, are you good for this? Okay. In the original language, you have these words called participles. And a lot of you know uh, what participles are. A participle is a verb. Now, teenagers, listen up because see, English is important. Participles are verbs in Greek that modify the main verb. And so what you have in green on the screen behind you are the participles modifying make disciples. And so... Literally, it's as you are going, make disciples of all nations. The next two participles describe what making disciples look like. Number one, making disciples is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Secondly, making disciples looks like teaching them to obey. And that's, that's, it's so simple when you see it, in how it was written originally. Now, one more thing. A participle in Greek takes on the force of the main verb. So your your translations aren't lying to you because the participle as you are going then becomes go. Does that make sense? And baptize and teach. But they're modifying the main verb, which is main, uh, make disciples. So the main thing that we're to do as as believers, as a church, is to make disciples and not harvest decisions. It's not, hey, how many people uh, raise their hand and pray to prayer? It's not, okay, kneel down by your bedside and ask Jesus into your heart. That is not the, the main command. The main command is to make disciples, make people who are following Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk more about that part of it next week. Okay? But a principle of interpretation in the Bible that's very important is this. If a a truth is repeated in Scripture, that truth must be important. So my question is, is the Great Commission and that truth repeated in Scripture? And the answer is an overwhelming yes. 
For example, just, just consider this, Mark 16. And he said to them, go into all the world, proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Think about Luke 24, 47 to 49. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are to be witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you're clothed with power on, from on high. Consider also John twenty twenty one. Jesus said unto them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And Jesus said that he is sent from the Father to unbind the captives, captives, spiritual captives, to set at liberty those who need to be set at liberty, to, to heal the sick, talking about the spiritually sick, and, and to, to um, heal the brokenhearted. And we could go on with that. But whatever Jesus was sent to do is what we're sent to do. How about Acts 1.8? But I, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so it's repeated over and over and over. And so the Great Commission, the job of all uh, believers, is to share the good news. I cannot think of a more blessed privilege, a more important thing to do, than to tell people about Jesus Christ. Think with me for just a minute. What if you had the cure for cancer? There is no real cure for cancer. We know that. There, um, there, there's all kinds of different treatments. But what if you came up with a, pu- a cure? Literally, you take this pill one time, your cancer's completely gone. Would you hoard it for yourself? Think back when uh, the plague was going through. What if, what if back when the plague was going through, you happened to come back from the future, you know, the movie, Back to the Future. You go back, you have the vaccine, the antidote to the bubonic plague or whatever, and and the, the city is just being decimated by the plague, and you had all these, the, the doses of it you could have given out, and you didn't give it out. Wouldn't that be a shame? You have the words of eternal life. You have the ability to share the good news that a person can turn to Jesus in faith and live and avoid all of eternity in hell, in punishment. That's, that is way more important than a cure for cancer than a new vaccination, than whatever you want to pick. It's, it's way, it's far more important. You have the greatest news of all. Jesus saves. As long as there is one person in the world who does not know Christ, the church has a mandate to keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming. But here's the question. Several of those verses mention the word gospel. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? That's a, that's a, that's a, actually, that's not an easy question for a lot of people to answer, what the gospel is. A lot of churches get confused about what the gospel is. If we're going to proclaim the gospel, it might be good to know what the gospel is. I want you to turn to Romans 1. Romans 1. We live in an increasingly secular age. More and more people do not have a Christian reference and even know the basics of the Christian message. Far back in, our, in American history, and probably even when a lot of you were young, most everybody that you knew had some Christian reference in mind, didn't they? They knew the basics of the, the gospel, maybe even knew some of the Bible stories and things. We are, we are beyond that now. The vast majority of people in the United States do not know any part of the gospel message. And I would say that perhaps Paul's message to the Romans contains the clearest step-by-step expression of what Paul understood to be the good news. And so in Romans chapter 1, I want you to notice what Paul says in verse number 16. 
he says this. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So here he says, The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not your winsome words. It's not your beautiful face. It's not your great personality. It's the gospel. You don't have to come up with some great illustration. You don't have to you don't have to come up with some hook. You simply give the pure unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the power of God to salvation. Isn't that great? Well, what does Paul do? So he takes the next chapters and the first four chapters, and he explains in wonderful detail what that good news is. And he provides even a structure for presentation of the gospel and a few critical truths that show up again and again in his preaching of the gospel. I just want to give them to you. Let's walk through four chapters of Romans real fast. You ready? First question, to whom are we accountable? That's the first question that that Paul is answering they may not be answering that or asking that question, but he, he gets them to ask that question. Paul tells his readers that it is God to whom they are accountable. Paul begins his presentation of the gospel by declaring in, in ch- chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Humanity is not autonomous. We didn't create ourselves. We didn't evolve ourselves. We are neither self-reliant nor self-accountable. We, because he created us, he has the right to demand that we worship him. And so therefore, in verse number 21, look what happens. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God, nor give thanks to him. But because they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. God has authority over us. We are made by him owned by him, dependent upon them, and therefore accountable to him. That's what he says, isn't it? He, he says that very clearly. In that. Now the next question, if we're accountable to God then, what is our problem? He tells his readers that the problem is that they have rebelled against God. They and everyone else along with them did not honor God and did not give thanks to him that they should have. And so in verse number 23, their foolish hearts were darkened and they exchanged the glory of an immortal God for images uh, resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And it used to be that I used to be able to stand up in a pulpit and say, you know what? We don't worship plants and animals and stuff like that. Our idols are a little more sophisticated than that. Other than the fact that this last week it came out that Union Theological Seminary uh, just had a service, a religious worship service, where they bowed down to plants in the middle of the auditorium and begged uh, the plants for their forgiveness and repentance. And so it is becoming more and more mainstream in the United States. Their idols are not our retirement funds, our children's successes, and everything else. That Our idols are now becoming literal plants and animals just like the Bible said it would be. And so even though we know God, we don't worship him. That's a, it's a truly revolting image, isn't it? For a human to consider their creator and then decide that a wooden or metal image or a frog or a bird or even themselves are more glorious and more satisfying and more valuable, it's the height of insult against God. It really is. And so for the next, most of the next three chapters, <coughs> Paul presses this point, indicating all humanity are sinners against God. Chapter 1, he indicts the Gentiles, didn't he? That's what he does in chapter 1. And the Jews are saying, that's right, Paul, you get those Gentiles. And so chapter 2, he indicts the Jews. He's equal opportunity, um, whatever. So whatever you want to say there. In chapter 3... He then indicts the whole world. Look at Romans 3.19. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped. And look at what he says. And the whole 
world may be accountable to God. And so this is what he does. He says, you Jews, you want to make yourself accountable to God or by the law? Fine. We'll make you accountable to the law, but you must realize that the law is in place so that the whole world becomes accountable to God because it's universal. It's God's universal uh, demand, if you want to say that. So strictly speaking, these first two points are not good news, are they? Have I, have I given you any good news yet? Okay, they're not really good news at all. As a matter of fact, they are bad news. Uh, that I have rebelled against the holy and judging God who made me is not a happy thought. I don't like thinking. Uh, can you imagine putting your kids down at night? Put them down. Now remember, Johnny, you have rebelled against God and he's going to judge you. We don't do that. But it is an important one because it paves the way for the genuine good news, which are the next two points. What is God's solution to the problem is the next question that he answers. And that is found in uh, verse, uh, John 3.21. Paul says that God's solution to humanity's sin is the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But now, Paul says, in spite of our sin, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. In other words, what he's saying is there is a way for human beings to be counted righteous before God instead of unrighteous, to be declared innocent instead of guilty, to be justified instead of condemned. And it has nothing to do with acting better or having a more righteous life or being more religious. And so does that, how does that happen? He puts it very plainly in verse number 24. Look at Romans 3, 24. Despite a rebellion against God, in the face of a hopeless situation, we can be justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. What a blessing. Through Jesus Christ's sacrificial death and resurrection, sinners may be saved from the condemnation that our sin deserves. That's good news. Next question that nobody was asking is this. So how do we become included in that salvation? He finally tells his readers how how they themselves can be included. The salvation has been provided, comes, verse number 22, through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. By trusting Him and no one other to save me. In Romans 4, 5, And to the one who does not work, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly. And there's those great words. His faith is counted as righteousness. Hearkening all the way back to Genesis. When the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And that is genuine good news. I can be saved from the wrath of God, whom I'm accountable to because he saved me. Because of the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, I can be saved through faith in him. What a wonderful message. That's the greatest news in all the world. But that brings us to ask another question that you weren't asking this morning when you woke up. And that is, whose responsibility is it to share that good news? Whose responsibility is it to evangelize? Well, I'm looking at everybody whose responsibility is, right? It's ours. It's everyone's responsibility. Look look at this. I'm going to have you turn to Acts 11 real quick. Acts 11. We have plenty of time. Acts 11. Acts 11 is uh, talking about the persecution of the church and um, the, the, the religious authorities in Jerusalem are persecuting the church. And so the, the, the Christians, they, they scatter because the persecution is so intense. In Acts 11, verse number 19, look at what it says. And this is God's plan. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to none except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number 
turn to the Lord. Now notice, there's no missionary being sent. There's no apostle mentioned here. It's average Joe church member. Um, Levi church member, how's that? Because they were Jew. It doesn't matter. It's average church member going and telling the good news. Does God excite you enough? Do you worship God in such a way that sharing the good news is just a, just a, something that's a joy in your heart? Uh, I, um, as I told you, I traveled to Memphis the uh, last three days, and and I, I spent part of yesterday in the airport. And you know how it is in the airport: thousands of people. You know, with the spoken hub system, it empties out, fills up, empties out like an accordion or something. And um, you just watch when those airplanes all come in all at once. Thousands of people walk by, and I just sat there watching the people for just a minute, thinking, Lord, how tragic is it? These people are thinking they're living living their best lives, and they have no idea what's to befall them. And I just started praying. I'd see like a little boy just happily skipping down, Lord, would you please bring the gospel to that young man somehow? And, and praying for people, the burden of the heart, we have the greatest news in all the world. Let me ask you something. Do you love God? And do you love others enough that you're willing to share that gospel with people? They didn't hold big evangelistic crusades. While major events and services in the church do play a role in uh, evangelism, the bedrock of gospel ministry is low-key, ordinary, day-by-day work that, that, that often goes unseen. Most gospel ministry involves ordinary people doing ordinary things with gospel intentionality, telling it one by one to people that they they see. Whether it's helping a friend, working at the office, going to the movies, there's a commitment to building relationships and modeling the Christian faith and talking about the gospel as a natural part of your conversation. Do you do that? That's what we're called to do. And so... Really, the the vehicle for ordinary, or I'm sorry, the vehicle for the gospel message is ordinary life. The ordinary life needs to be accompanied by gospel intentionality. Ordinary life needs to be saturated with a commitment to living and proclaiming the gospel. Ordinary life needs to be saturated with a commitment to be praying for those who are around you to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Committed to evangelism through uh, church community works only if the, the, the priority of the gospel is strong within that community. Otherwise, we simply have a form of of good relationships that never go anywhere. Your relationships with people who are outside this congregation ought to be such that you have the opportunity and you make the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Now I'm kind of stepping on toes, aren't I? I really don't mean to. Seriously, I don't. By the way, we have tracks. I don't know if you knew that. We have tracks out there. Christmas is coming up. We'll have all kinds of Christmas tracks. You may get tongue-tied or whatever else, but you can definitely give a track to a relative, give a track to a co- co-worker or whatever else. These are, th- these are things that we can do. But the gospel is spread through one-by-one relationships for the most part. Now, here's another question you're not asking. What about the nations? What about, what about people in Togo, right? What about people in Russia? What about people in Venezuela and so on and so forth? Do we have a responsibility to those people? The answer is yes. Yes, yes, yes. Now, churches tend to get focused on an either-or thing. It's really hard for a church to be balanced between I'm going to serve this community and share the gospel in this community and I'm going to be reaching all the nations. But we're literally called for a two-pronged attack and be doing it both ways. And it's really hard for a church to balance. And so when you, when you look at the nations, um, we, we need to think back to the Great Commission itself. Turn back to Matthew 28. I'm going to be closing up real fast here. Matthew 28. Let's look at the Great Commission one more time. The Great Commission says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of your neighbors. Uh, your family? Nah. 
what does it say? Nations, all nations. That word all is the word all kinds, panta, all kinds of nations. That's the responsibility. Now, he's giving this commission to a small group of Jewish believers that are on the Mount of Olives right before he ascends. Most of them apostles, but not all of them. Mark chapter 16, it says, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The whole creation. And so at Jesus' ascension, he said, You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. We are witnesses. We are witnesses to the saving power of Jesus Christ. And so when we start thinking about this, from the New Testament, and I don't have time, and I'm not going to take time to do this now, but this was my, my dissertation topic, by the way. Um, we, as a church, have a responsibility to be systematic and to be intentional about the gospel getting out to all the nations. Our responsibility includes, number one, commissioning missionaries and sending them out. My prayer is that Providence Bible Church will become a missionary sending church. I regularly pray for the children in this church that God will call missionaries from our children, pastors from our children, so on and so forth. And I'm not talking about missionaries, not only foreign missionaries, but missionaries where they are in their jobs. And I'm really wanting us to be commissioning people that grew up in our church going to the mission field. Wouldn't that be great? We're also tasked with the responsibility to give financial support to Acts 13 and 14. You can read it and see it. We should be supporting missions abroad. Our money, you can't, most of you can't go to the mission field, but you can go to the mission field by giving money to missions. We are tasked with praying for the mission fields. Uh, I systematically pray for missionaries every week. We should too. It's something that I would like for us to start incorporating into our morning worship service, by the way. I think that would be awesome to be praying for our missionaries together on Sunday morning. And finally, the other thing that we're, we're to do is we're also to make sure that they're accountable. I won't talk about that, but there needs to be a relationship such that we can be accountable to them. And so what does all of this require of us? As, as I begin to wrap this up, I want to give you two more priorities that come from our, our mission statement. And the first priority is constant evangelism. That's one priority. Speaking the good news of Jesus Christ to friends, family, neighbors should be a natural part of our lives as Christians. We, therefore, Providence Bible Church, want to be constantly about the work of evangelism. We want to be known as a people who go out of our way to build relationships with people who do not yet know the gospel. And when you think about it, think about this. The work of salvation is the work of God. Did you know Ken and I could, could go out and we could present the gospel all day long to people and not see any fruit? It is only God who opens the heart to understand the gospel, isn't it? That's what we saw about Lydia, the seller of purple. It is only God who breathes life into the dead. With this realization, there comes another priority. You ready? The second priority ought to be bold prayer. Bold prayer. We believe that our God delights to hear the prayers of his people he delights to answer our prayers. And because of that, we want to be a church that prays boldly to him, trusting him always to work all things together to, for the good of those who love him. Lord Jesus, send out labors from Providence Bible Church in the Culpeper County and surrounding areas. Lord Jesus, help me to come across one person this week with a heart to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that I can give the gospel to. There's so many avenues. We have Young Life, right? We have Young Life you can be involved in. The Pregnancy Center you can be involved in. Um, the Children's Bible Ministries you can be involved in. And so many other organizations here. But you can do it one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, and you can do it with your neighbor. But Lord, thrust people out. We can be bold in our prayer. Lord, make this a missionary sending church. 
take our little ones. What greater privilege is it than that they be scattered all over the world proclaiming the gospel to people who've never heard Jesus Christ? We can be bold in our prayer that way. We can be bold in our prayer. Lord, we have a junior church going on right now. Save those little children. Those are precious little souls who need to be saved from their sin and from the punishment that comes with it. We need to be bold in our prayer, don't we? It's bold prayer. We're we're engaged in spiritual warfare. Therefore, we need to go to the source of power to overcome the spiritual battle. If you've been sitting in the Old Testament survey class, what is one thing that we've learned? You do not do spiritual warfare without praying first. Otherwise, it's going to be a failure. And we can have all the ministries going on here at, for, at uh, Pro, I just about said First Baptist. I've been here a year. Sorry. Providence Bible Church, we can have all these children's ministries, youth ministries, uh, um, um, even the young life that we um, support, and all these different things going on here, Sunday school and so on and so forth. But if there is no prayer going on behind it, we're wasting our time. And the Bible is very clear about that when you read the Old Testament. You, before you do battle, you spend time um, supplicating with the Lord in prayer. That Wednesday evenings, for the PBC would become a house of prayer. What, what a magnificent thing that would be. That, that Wednesday evenings, we would see our auditorium full of people engaging with God in prayer, praying for lost souls, praying for hearts to be open, praying for missions to advance around the world. What a blessed privilege it is. When I was um, uh, working on my dissertation, I ran across a little book. It was called The Pastor and Modern Missions. It was written in 1906. The Pastor and Modern Missions. In there, the author stated this. Listen to what he said. He said, when we pray... We are literally extending our our ministry to places that we'll never be able to go. I may never physically be able to minister in Venezuela, but I can minister to Venezuela by praying for the Dawsons. I may never be able to share the gospel with a young pregnant woman whose life is falling apart, but I can pray for those who are at the pregnancy center. Same thing with Young Life and all these other, the Gideons, the jail ministries. There's several people that, that go preach in the jails. All these things, you can't, you can't maybe physically be there, but you can spiritually be there. What a, what a great way to do battle. He went on to say this. He said, the source of spiritual vitality and prayer of any Christian mo- movement, power, I'm sorry, of any Christian movement is prayer. Everything vital to the missionary enterprise hinges upon prayer. The opening of a difficult field depends upon prayer. By all accounts, Mike Dawson said this summer that that Venezuela is a difficult field to open. Look at the quote again. The opening of a difficult field depends upon prayer. Wouldn't you love to lock arms with a missionary side by side with them, praying for them on a daily basis or a weekly basis? Wouldn't that be great? We can do that when we pray for them. You can do that in your home when you pray. You can do that. You can teach your little ones spiritual warfare by praying for missionaries. You can come here on a Wednesday evening in our our spiritual prayer meeting, and we can pray and pray and pray. May God make Providence Bible Church a praying church doing spiritual warfare on their knees before the throne of God who has the power to overcome all evil. We have the ability to give people the greatest news that they've ever heard. But we know that the vast majority of people don't hear it because their hearts have been opened to hear it. And so therefore, we go out and we evangelize prayerfully, don't we? My prayer is that Providence Bible Church is an evangelistic church. That Providence Bible Church is a praying church. These are priorities. Our priorities are worship, service, evangelism. And we'll look at a fourth one 
next week. Where are you, dear believer? There are definitely people who have the gift of evangelism, but all of us are called to evangelize. Sometimes what you do is you plant the seed for the person with the gift to come back and evangelize and see them saved. No, no problem with that. When I evangelize people, um, I got my hair cut this week, as you can tell. Talk to, the, talk to the girl that cuts my hair about the gospel. She's not even interest, remotely interested in it, but I can tell you what. Every time I walk out of there, I'm happy as a lark. You know why? I'm sharing the gospel. And one day God may plant the seed in some, that somebody else gets water. I don't care. That's fine. But I just want to see her get saved. And you, you run into people like that all the time. May God make us an evangelistic church. Share the gospel. It doesn't depend upon you at all. It depends upon God. All you got to do is give it to him. Lord, we thank you that um, you tell us that uh, Christ has all the authority and all of the earth-shattering, overwhelming power of God is in the gospel message. Grip our hearts with that truth, Lord. Break our hearts for the need of the people around us and gladden our hearts at the power of God through his gospel and through prayer. Amen.